Good day, Mr. Arlinghouse. Today is, and I'm forgive me. Today is Thursday, uh, the 28th, 29th. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I skipped yesterday. Um, my plate was just too full of things to do. I had to clear out right after school, uh, so I'm sorry. Uh, probably should have given you a heads up, uh, but uh, I'm a loser. What do you? What do you want? Uh, but you like my uh, shirt, Miss Longhouse? Nice blue. Yeah. Recognize? Yeah, this. Yes. Mm. Uh, I mean, what, what amazes me is I can get away with wearing these things here. Nobody even looks at it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, let's get to uh, work. Let's talk about Vietnam, shall we? So after President Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. His successor, Lyndon Johnson, uh, Lyndon Johnson, I mean, Kennedy and Johnson, a great comparison. Kennedy, Massachusetts aristocracy. Johnson, this good old boy from Texas who had uh, come up, you know, through the ranks of Congress, uh, was a politician, uh, a, yeah, a great legislator. And really full of himself. Yeah, I can tell you stories about Lyndon Johnson. And, you know, he's not as bad as he's often made out to be. But, of course, he's not as great as he thought he was. I mean, the guy, the guy used to go around the world and fly an Air Force One. And anytime he was flying across, like, for example, a state, he would call down to the governor of the state, just let him know, let him know that. Same thing with other countries. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the stories about Lyndon Johnson was, you know, he used to travel around and uh, he would give people plaster busts, you know, bust, statue, the head statue of himself. They came in three sizes, small, medium, and large, depending upon how much he thought you two, you and the, him and the person had in common. And uh, <clears throat> there was one incident where... Uh, the president of Australia, Harold Holt, had died, uh, been eaten by a shark. I mean, he's lost in the surf. They never found him. And he, along with a lot of other world leaders, went down to Australia to pay their respects. And so President Johnson figured he was going to make this into a world tour, a tour that would culminate with President Johnson, get this, going uninvited to be in Vatican City on Christmas Eve. I mean, in the city. I mean, it's like the Pope had nothing else to do. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, uh, he flies into Australia, gives it his due diligence, flies over to uh, uh, Vietnam, reviews the troops. Uh, there was <laughs> there was one time President Johnson was in California. Uh, Mr. Jo Mr. Uh, whatever your name is. Arlinghouse, uh, and um, he was reviewing the troops at El Toro, a big Marine base. And, you know, uh, he reviews the troops, and he starts towards a helicopter. And a young captain, uh, he's going, and he's going towards the wrong, the wrong helicopter. He wasn't going to the Marine uh, Corps, uh, Air Force Two, you know, whatever it's called, Marine Corps Two, whatever it's called, the presidential helicopter. A young captain jumps in front, snaps a salute, and says, Sir, you're going to the wrong helicopter. Your helicopter's over there. And he looked at him and said, Boy, don't you know they're all my helicopters? I mean, that was Johnson. Uh, anyway, so he flies into Vietnam, stays there, views troops, then flies to Karachi, Pakistan, for some reason. And like I said, on Christmas Eve, he... On Christmas Eve, you know, with, and you know what Christmas Eve is like in Vatican City. Not only, of course, is there a giant throng going to Mass inside the Vatican, but there's a giant throng. Hundreds of thousands of people have packed themselves into uh, St. Peter's Square out in front of the St. Peter's Basilica. And suddenly there are these four giant marine helicopters flying above, dripping oil. Because, you know, helicopters drip oil on the people below, hot oil. And then one of those helicopters carrying President Johnson 
uh, lands in the Pope's garden. And I don't know how much you know about helicopters, these big things. The wash of the helicopter just ripped out shrubs and vegetation out of there. And he lands there, gets out of the presidential helicopter, runs into the Pope's private library, and gives the Pope a large size plaster bust of himself. Yeah, I mean, he was an interesting guy. But let's get back to it, shall we? So, uh, as it says there, Lyndon Johnson greatly expanded the role of the United States in South Vietnam until it reached a height of some 500,000 soldiers in 1968, one of which, Mr. Arlinghouse, was my first cousin who uh, stepped on a mine uh, guarding a hospital outside of Saigon, what is now Ho Chi Minh City, but Saigon. And, uh, yeah, he lost his leg, um, you know. Um, so... What was the Gulf of Tonkin incident and the Gulf of Tonkin resolution? See, that's an interesting thing. Uh, supposedly, the Gulf of Tonkin incident was the incident that caused the United States to really step up its troop presence uh, in Vietnam. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident was where uh, some American ships were out in international waters and they were fired upon by, you know, Vietnamese uh, coastal patrol or whatever. And after that, President Johnson uh, pushed through Congress the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution that says the United States has uh, the right, whatever, to begin sending lots of people, lots of equipment, lots of soldiers uh, into Vietnam. Here's the thing. Um, there is no evidence. There's no evidence that the Gulf of Tonkin incident ever happened. Uh, it was just, yeah, uh, it was fabricated. 500,000 soldiers le later, 55,000 of which never came back. As the war escalated, the United States took a larger role. North Vietnam was bombed more heavily than Germany had been bombed in World War II. As it says there, 55,000 Americans never came back, and 2,500 Americans, uh, of those, 2,500 of those remain unaccounted for. They, you know... Uh, were they all POWs? No, they weren't. Some of them were just shot down uh, and or, or died in the jungle, and the jungle ate them. You know, um, they were never accounted for. Ho Chi Minh, at one point in time, greatly uh, uh, had it. I'm sorry, Ho Chi Minh had an interview with, I think it was either Life Magazine or Time Magazine. I think it was Life Magazine. And he told the reporter there, he said that you will kill 10 of us and we will kill 10 of you. You will spend money that we don't have and we will win the war. And what he meant by that was we're not going anywhere. You know, the Americans, uh, you know, especially when, you know, with television, with television reports coming in from the front showing body bags with American soldiers in those body bags. Uh, the war quickly divided this country. In 1968, because of high U.S. involvement in the unpopular war, Lyndon Johnson did not seek re-election and was succeeded by Richard Nixon. Uh, long story short, what happened was that uh, the United States, you know, their troop involvement from 1963 to 1968 kept increasing, increasing, and to be honest, the United States, they were winning all the major confrontations. And the Secretary of Defense, and I remember watching the speech. I'm old, Mr. John, Mr. Arlinghouse. Uh, where the Secretary of War, rather, Secretary of Defense got up there and he talked about how uh, the Vietnamese were on their last legs, the North Vietnamese were on the run, the Viet Cong were losing at every turn. Uh, and then came... Um, then came Tet, T-E-T. -E What's Tet? Tet is the biggest holiday in the, on the calendar in Southeast Asian culture. It literally is like New Year's, Christmas, and the Fourth of July all rolled up into one. And traditionally, there had always been a ceasefire during Tet and a ceasefire during Christmas, but ceasefire during Tet. And so, ceasefire, American uh, soldiers stood down. Well, on this Tet, uh, 
American installations all over Vietnam came under attack. I mean, and the Viet Cong were literally at the doors of the American Embassy in South Vietnam, 1968. And yeah, eventually all those, they were all beaten back with tremendous losses on the part of the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, North Vietnamese regular, regulars, army. But uh, what this proved was that they weren't going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, like uh, Ho Chi Minh said, they weren't going anywhere. That this war was not over, it was far from over, and uh, that was broadcast on television, and President Johnson just said, he, and it's a strange thing, uh, President Johnson did not run for re-election in 1968, even though he'd been planning to, uh, and he lit he died within two years. Yeah, I mean, he died a broken man. N now, but also, Nixon... You know, everybody talks about how bad Johnson was and Nixon ending the war. Johnson, actually, Johnson actually in <clears throat> 1968, uh, Johnson actually in the spring of that year had all the major parties in the war, North Vietnam, Viet Cong, South Vietnam government, and the United States, he had them all agree to go to meet and work out their stuff. And uh, it looked very favorable that the United States, uh, rather, was going to get out of Vietnam, and they were going to just everybody was going to go back to the 17th parallel, and they were all going to go home. But Richard Nixon, who once again was not president at the time, but he was wanting to run for president. Richard Nixon got a message through to the uh, president of Vietnam. Uh, and uh, said, hey, look, if you sabotage, if you blow this conference, if you simply refuse to negotiate, we'll get you a better deal. And, you know, by, he didn't just mean the country of Vietnam. He meant the president of Vietnam personally. <clears throat> and so he did. Now, how do we know about this? In fact, Johnson knew about that. Why? Because... President Johnson had the office of the uh, Vietnamese president bugged, now, which was illegal. And so President Johnson knew what Nixon had done, but he couldn't say anything about it. And so, yeah. Interesting, no? Anyway, 1969, Nixon began his program of Vietnamization of the war, which meant basically pulling American soldiers out and giving their duties over to Arvin. Army of the Republican of Vietnam. We represent the Arvain Army. Arvain Army. Come on, you ever watch Good Morning Vietnam, Mr. Arlinghouse? Army of the Republic of Vietnam. Who, uh, to be honest, I mean, uh, the Arvin soldiers were, their motivation was questionable at best. In 1968, lengthy peace agreements were begun, and that finally concluded in 1973. That ended the United States' involvement in the war. In early 1975, the Viet Cong and, and I remember, it was spring, it was in April of 1975. I remember I was in my college dormitory listening to the radio. And I remember uh, when Saigon fell. The North Vietnamese, NVA, North Vietnamese Army, forced the South Vietnamese government to surrender and the war was over. In conclusion, the war had been bad U.S. policy from the beginning even though the North Vietnamese government, uh, as well as the Viet Cong, were supported by Chinese and Russian interests, they, the Chinese and Russians, never had the control that you know the United States policymakers thought they did. This was not an exercise in containment. This was a civil war. So just as the war, capitalized, just as the war in Vietnam caused what's caused largely by a power vacuum caused by the exit of the Japanese and the French conflicts in the Middle East were caused by a power hole left by the British. In 1967, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser began massing troops on his border for a planned Arab takeover of Israel. How does this happen? On June the 5th, who writes this? One thing at least, Mr. Arlinghouse. I'm cleaning up my notes. 
1967, the Israelis preempted this by launching an airstrike against the Egyptians. Uh, yes, uh, and back then, Egypt was not called Egypt, it was called the UAR, the United Arab Republic, which, Miss Darling House, the UAR was a combination of Egypt, Jordan, and I think Syria. And they call themselves the United Arab Republic. Oh, yeah. Immediately, Syria and Jordan both attacked Israel, and Horton misspelled Jordan. This became known as the Six Day War. Why? Because it lasted six days. And in six days, Israel made short work of its Arab rivals and had increased its land holding all the way to um, the Suez Canal, all the way to the Golan Heights. In fact, Israel was bigger after the Six Day War than it had been since the days of King David. Nasser died in 1970 and was replaced by Anwar el Sadat. Sadat told the Soviets to leave Egypt because he didn't trust them. Sadat felt the only way to unify Egypt was to attack Israel once again and regain the land the Israelis had taken. In 1973, during the Jewish holy day of Yom Kippur, the most holy day of the Jewish calendar, the Egyptians attacked and after being initially successful, were thrown back by the Israeli army. During the Yom Kippur War, Arab nations, this is 1973, cut off oil exports to the West in an effort to get the supporters of Israel, including the United States. And I remember this. You know, there was an oil embargo. There were giant lines in the gas station to get the supporters of Israel to use their influence to force the Israelis to give in. In November 1977, Anwar Sadat flew to Israel to meet with the Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, thus becoming the first Arab state to recognize the existence of the state of Israel. Although Sadat was condemned throughout the Arab world, he bravely then went to Washington, D.C. This was uh, Jimmy Carter, a good, good man, a bad, bad president. But this was Jimmy Carter's first, best, most historic accomplishment during his presidency. And no, Jimmy Carter was a good man. Uh, he's a great man. But as a president, he, I mean, he, you would not believe how intelligent he was. He was so intelligent. But it's one of those kind of intelligence where the facts often paralyzed his ability to make a decision. And if you're a president, that's your primary job. You have to make decisions. But anyway, back to the matter hand. So even though Sadat was condemned throughout the Arab world, he bravely went to Washington, D.C. and signed the Camp David Accords <clears throat> in Camp David, Maryland, the presidential retreat, which were a landmark of peace in the Middle East. For the first time, there was peace in the Middle East. And once again, this was the highest watermark of Jimmy Carter's presidency. Sadat was assassinated in 1981. And I remember that day, too. We had a soccer game that day. His own guards machine gunned him. Uh, and in December of 1981, Israel annexed what had been the Lebanese and Syrian territories in the Golan, he Golan Heights. The Golan Heights are on the border of Lebanon and Israel in, uh, in northern Israel. Uh, they annexed them because these Golan Heights made a perfect place to bomb Israel using artillery. A huge obstacle to peace is the future of the Palestinians who had been uprooted by the Israelis from the beginning in the building of Israel. Lebanon became the center of Mideast unrest for a while. The PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization, I should write that out. Do you think this wrong is? See, when I wrote this so long ago, PLO, everybody knew what it meant. They knew who Yasser Arafat was. Had long used southern Lebanon as a base to make raids into Israel. <laughs> Gonna work. You know, something wonky about this. So, the Israeli army attacked and seized southern Lebanon. Lebanon then fell into a civil war, which eventually involved, who writes this? The United States. 
the United States under President Reagan sent Marines to Lebanon to maintain order, and at first they did. The Civil War, by the way, matched the Muslims in Lebanon versus the Christians in Lebanon. People tend to forget that there is a significant Christian minority in many uh, in many uh, Arab countries, and Lebanon is one of those. And so the United States Marines made the mistake of picking sides in the Civil War. The Muslims responded by uh, getting one of their guys, uh, and they put him in a Datsun, little Datsun pickup truck, loaded the back end of the pickup truck with C4 explosives, drove that pickup truck through the front gate of the Marine barracks, right into the Marine barracks, and then when he... Uh, got, he drove through the door of the Marine barracks and then pushed the plunger on uh, the bombs and blew himself and 300 Marines to, the, to their deaths. And the United States withdrew. Yeah, and they withdrew quick. In 1985, the Israeli army withdrew from southern Lebanon. Lebanon then became home for terroristic kidnappings by some Muslim splinter groups of British, French, and American citizens. Mm, to this day, Lebanon is still a, an unsettled country. Not as much as it was, but yeah. What is the Intifada? The Intifada is the uprising, the Palestinian uprising in Israel. It is an ugly situation. In 1988, Yasser Arafat declared the recognition, recognition of the State of Israel and the renunciation of terrorism. In 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait, and in the subsequent brief war that saw the defeat of, the, of Iraq, the PLO was also discredited and isolated from support from its sister Arab states. Radical groups amongst the Arabs and the reject, Israelis reject any peace, and the quiet of the Middle East, I mean, it's still tenuous at best. Roman numeral 20, after World War II, all European countries, except for Portugal and Spain, became liberal democracies. From the beginning of the era, all Western European countries, yeah, it was recognized that for democracy to work, it would need a strong social and economic base. Christian democratic parties would have a good, had a good deal of success after the war. These parties were associated with the Roman Catholic Church, they opposed communism, they were progressive, accepted democracy, and social reform. West Germany was called, and it still is, the economic miracle for its remarkable recovery after World War II. The Labour Party in Britain under Clement Attlee introduced the welfare state, yeah, the welfare state and, nas and nationalized several large industries. The welfare state, that's a good term. Because you say, what does it mean? Well, the welfare state uh, refers to the idea of cradle to the grave, government taking care of the people. I mean, providing not just education, but food, uh, unemployment if ne necessary, uh, providing college, providing, oh, wait for it, national health care, uh, providing, uh, you know, a large amount of vacation, uh, cradle to the grave, literally. Uh, of course, the downside is, in such countries, the tax rates have to be incredibly high. In 1997, the Labor Party returned to power but became much more conservative. Margaret Thatcher pushed Britain towards a free market economy and away from labor unions and the welfare state. France was beset by problems at home and abroad. Much of this was the colonial land holdings the French held in Asia and Africa. Charles de Gaulle took over the leadership of France <coughs> in the 60s and ran it according to his own agenda. That agenda included hostility with Great Britain and the United States. It also included the maintenance of a large nuclear capacity. When I visited France in 1989, 70% of all electrical power in France was generated through nuclear, uh, by nuclear plants. I don't know if that's the same anymore. I imagine still part of it is. 
Problem is, nuclear power plants produce nuclear waste. Uh, that also included an ultimate withdrawal from NATO. France pulled out of NATO, one of the anchor members. He created a government called the Fifth Republic, and in 1968 had to rally his forces to hold on to power. A lot of young people didn't like him. He was on in 1969. French government under the hands of leaders like Valéry Giscard d'Estaing and Francois Mitterrand. I can't pronounce that, Mr. Longhouse. European cooperation of the latter part of the 20th century has been pursued most successfully in the realm of economics. The coal and steel community was a great success in enlarging the production capacity of the involved countries. Another anchor of European economic cooperation has been the EEC, or the so-called common market. And by the way, so it begins as the coal and steel community. In other words, a group of coal and steel producing countries like uh, Germany, like uh, France, like uh, the Netherlands. And then they branch out into including more countries and they call themselves the EEC, the European Economic Community or the Common Market. And eventually, Mr. Arlinghouse, this is going to become the EU, the European Union. Signed in 1957 through the Treaty of Rome, the six members of the coal and steel community sought to eliminate tariffs, provide free-flowing capital, and labor. In other words, you could, labor could move from one country to another without having to go through all sorts of hoops. Britain tried to enter the common market twice, but was vetoed by Charles de Gaulle, who didn't like the British because the British were too close to the United States. In 1973, though, Britain, Ireland, and Denmark became uh, members of the, e the uh, common market. Then comes the Treaty of Maastricht, which was aimed to create something called the EU, the European Union, which was dedicated to an even more economically cooperative, cooperative Europe. Uh, you know, which eventually, to, you go to these the EU countries today, and most of them use the euro as their system of currency, although. When I went to Europe in 2018 and visited Poland, uh, the Czech Republic, and Hungary, who were all members of the EU, none of them used the uh, euro as their currency. Now, France does, Germany does, Italy does, Spain does, Ireland does. The UK did not, even then. All right. So, um, two issues of major importance still confront the Union, the, the European Union. A, the newly freed European states after 1991, yeah, uh, you know, whose economies are not that strong but wanted to join the EU. And there was still concern about the revival of a strong Germany. You know, once again, Germany, uh, the wall came down in Germany in 1989. And, uh, you know, Germany was united not long after that, and a lot of people were concerned about a reunited, strong Germany. Under Leonid Brezhnev, the Soviet system, the Soviets had become increasingly repressive at home. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great, uh, the great uh, author, was expelled from the country and put under house arrest. Andrei Sakharov criticized the government for, for violating the Helsinki Accords, which are a series of human rights provisions. Brezhnev, though maneuvering in the government, became the most powerful Russian leader since Stalin. Brezhnev did, however, try to maintain a working relationship with the Americans in something, and you better know this word, Mr. Arlinghouse, in something called détente, which is a French word. It literally means peaceful coexistence. Even though the Russians supported the North Vietnamese in the Vietnam War, it was a limited support. Relations between the Nixon government and the Russians was comparatively warm compared to the days of the Cold War. Even though the Soviets were warm to the United States on the surface, the Soviets were still stockpiling weapons, increasing the military, which was a drain on their economy. Gerald Ford and Landon Brezhnev signed the Helsinki Accords, which basically recognized the Soviet Union's right to Eastern Europe, but also included statements regarding the Helsinki Accords regarding human rights, that the Soviets were supposed to observe, which, as we saw before, they didn't. 
Then in 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. What dummies. And to be honest, the Soviet Union stayed in Afghanistan 10 years and then pulled out. The United States has been in Afghanistan 20 years, and guess what they're going to do? They're going to pull out. Afghanistan, I hate to tell you, Mr. Ong, has been a black hole of foreign intervention since the days of Alexander the Great. But nobody listens to me. Uh, anyway, um, so I invaded Afghanistan. Jimmy Carter responded sharply. The United States refused to ratify, for example, the SALT II Treaty. You say, what's SALT II? Well, SALT stands for Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. Um, President Nixon had signed the first one with the Soviets. Carter had the second one, and uh, the Congress refused to sign it. The U.S. also refused to participate in the Moscow Olympics of 1980. Uh, the Reagan administration was much more aggressive and hard line with the Russians. Reagan relaxed the grain embargo with the Russians and talked less about Russian violation of human rights. He alarmed the Russians, though, by increasing military spending and discussing something called SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. Who spells this? Strategic Defense Initiative. And what's that? Um, it was a proposal to create a nuclear shield over the United States uh, by using uh, lasers to shoot down uh, incoming ICBM missiles, uh, missile to missile, Patriot missile things, and all kind of uh, devices that would render the U.S. impervious to a Soviet uh, nuclear attack and Reagan talked about it there's a there's probably Mr. Arlinghouse a good piece of evidence that towards the latter part of his second administration President Reagan was suffering the ravages of Alzheimer's I mean he talked about this like it already existed in fact um, and he kept military spending the Reagan plan was to force the Soviet Union to spend itself out of business. And it, that wasn't a bad plan. Well, because it worked for one thing. Now, Poland. Poland was a particular problem with the Soviet bloc, as its large and very devout pop Catholic population was very vocal. Let me, uh, let me, let me pause you, Mr. Arlinghouse. Give me a moment. And yes, and I'm back, Mr. Arlinghouse. Forgive me for going, but I wanted to show you some pictures of uh, my trip to Poland in 2016 uh, and visiting the Gdansk shipyard. But let's, first, let's go there, shall we? Uh, so Poland was plagued by mismanagement, and this led to a series of labor strikes. The economy of Poland caused the government to raise meat prices, and the Lenin shipyard in Gdansk was seized by workers. Strike quickly spread across Poland and was led by an electrician named Lech Walesa. The Polish courts then recognized this labor union solidarity as an independent labor union, and other changes swept through Poland. However, in 1981, General Wojciech Jaruzelski became the head of the Polish government and moved the army against solidarity. Quick look at these pictures, Mr. Stalinghouse. Feel free to use them. This is yours truly in Gdansk, Poland, and this is a monument to the workers who struck and put their lives on the line uh, against Soviet occupation. This, see that? That says, it's Polish, it says Solidarność. It means solidarity. It was a labor union. And this, a monument to the fallen. Uh, they wrote it in English, I believe, so that me and you could read it. See? Token of everlasting remembrance of the slaughter victims, a warning to rulers that no social conflict in our country can be resolved by force, a sign of hope for fellow citizens that evil need not prevail. Brave, very brave, Mr. Allinghouse, and please be amazed at my journeys. 
Uh, by the way, this I took from the top of St. Mary's Cathedral. See that blue out there, Mr. Arlington? That is the Baltic. And so, yes. And guess where we are, Mr. Arlington? We are at the end of this unit. Uh, I will also enclose the next unit uh, with this one when I finish canning this lesson. But yes, uh, and we'll move on, Mr. Arlington, trust me. And we're done with this. Thank you so much. And we 